Hi, I'm Stephen with Alberta Urban Garden .ca. This year I started the Testing Garden Assumptions series where I aim to take a look at garden practices, products and methods and put them to the scientific test. This series was really inspired and driven by you, the viewers, through your wonderfully thought out questions and comments on YouTube, email and Facebook. So today, I thought in the time-honored tradition of top lists on YouTube, I would give you the top five garden myths from the Testing Garden Assumption series that we have learned this year. The first video that was done in this series was a collaboration that I participated in with Patrick from the One Yard Revolution channel. When Patrick was planting his blueberries in the summer of 2014, he was evaluating methods to acidify the soil. Blueberries prefer soil that is generally more acidic than most garden soils, and pine needles have been recommended to help keep pH low. Mr. Chip Gardner, who also has a YouTube channel, stated in the comments section of Patrick's blueberry video that pine needles in fact did not make soil acidic. To my surprise, this statement was in fact true, and we explored the reasons why. It all boils down to the pine needles. They are acidic when they fall, however, as they decay, before they can transfer anything to the soil, they neutralize, resulting in no soil acidification. This was shocking to me, as I had heard from many trusted sources that if pine needles were used around your blueberries, it would help to acidify the soil. This drove me to ask more questions, and ultimately to create the Testing Garden Assumptions series here on YouTube. Similar to pine needles, Cold coffee will not help acidify the soil around your blueberries. The acid contained within the coffee is simply too weak to have a sustained effect on the soil's pH. The soil usually will very quickly buffer out any acid that is in the coffee, returning the soil to its original pH. Cold coffee also does not act as a fertilizer. Many sources state that people should avoid using treated lumber in vegetable gardens, as the materials used in the treatment can be harmful to you or the soil if it comes in contact. This common advice was correct at one point. However, about a decade ago, lumber producers, in response to these concerns, changed how they treat the lumber that homeowners can buy at the store. Treated lumber that you and I have access to is treated through a process called ACQ and is made up of a biocide and a copper containing chemical. The biocide and copper agent act in different ways to prevent bacterial and fungal colonization of the wood. The biocide used in treated lumber is the same biocide that's used in hospitals and restaurants. If you come in contact with it, it would be the same thing as coming in contact with a railing or a deck or a recently cleaned surface in a hospital or restaurant. In order to see if copper was leaching into the soils in dangerous levels, I sampled soil that had been in contact with treated lumber for three and nine years. The lab results from Maxim Analytics were supported by peer-reviewed research that showed the lumber did leach a little copper, but was well below the regulatory criteria. Interestingly, below the regulatory criteria, copper is considered an essential element for plant growth. The recommendation to avoid today's treated lumber in the garden is not supported by science and poses a very low risk to home gardeners. Often it's recommended to leave tap water out for a few days in a bucket or to use a filter before applying it in the garden. The reason is, the chlorine that's used to stabilize the water and make it safe for you and I to drink is said to kill bacteria within the soil that are beneficial. Bacteria in the soil are the driving force behind the nutrient cycle, releasing nutrients to the plants as they break down organic material. Bacteria is a great indicator for this test. Because the populations of bacteria represent a wide variety of species within the garden soil, some may be sensitive to chlorine, while others are resistant to chlorine. As I only use tap water when required, which is rarely, the populations of bacteria in my garden likely are quite robust and varied. I tested the effect of tap water on bacteria by taking samples of soil and adding them to deionized water before and after watering. There were no changes in the number of bacteria. It turned out that even in soil that was placed in 100% tap water, where bacteria numbers should have dropped significantly if chlorine caused damage, they did not show any difference between this and the control. As a result, it looks like the statement that tap water is harmful to the bacteria in garden soil is in fact a nether garden myth. Finally, this spring, we took a look at Epsom salts as a fertilizer in the garden. Epsom salts are made of magnesium and sulfur. Magnesium and sulfur are essential elements for plant growth. So, by this reasoning, many sources state by the use of Epsom salts in the garden, you're going to get many and a variety of positive results. It turns out that this practice, unless you have a known deficiency in magnesium and sulfur, is likely not required. 
I'd wager that most garden soils like my own have more than enough magnesium and sulfur, especially if you use compost. Surplus nutrients within the soil are simply either not used by the plants or can become harmful. Surplus concentrations of things like potassium can cause a nutrient lockout of other nutrients like magnesium. The application of more magnesium to a soil that is in a potassium lockout is not going to fix or solve the problem. In the end, if you had magnesium or sulfur deficiency, a much more sustainable method to fix it is to apply compost as a homemade compost made with free and local resources such as autumn leaves, coffee grounds, tea leaves, and comfrey have more than enough of both elements. Next year, I'm going to take a look at the claims made about compost tea and compost extractions, and whether or not we really do need to remineralize our garden soils. So keep the suggestions coming over YouTube, email, and Facebook, and we'll continue to put garden practices, assumptions, and products to the scientific test. If you'd like to check out in more detail any of the subjects we have spoken about today or other topics I have addressed in this series, make sure to check out the Testing Garden Assumptions series playlist. Thank you very much for joining me today. I appreciate it very much and I hope you have a fantastic day.